Welcome everyone to part one of the Female Health and Menstrual Cycle webinar. Um, just before I get started, just a couple of um, logistics to go through. So first of all, we're not using the hands up function today. Um, any questions we'll answer at the end, but if you can put them in the questions function, um, once we've gone through the presentation, we'll kind of go through those um, and hopefully answer as many as we can. Um, if you do have any technical issues along the way, if you want to put those in the chat um, and we'll try and get those resolved for you as well. Just a quick note going back to the questions. Um, it is still sometimes a bit of a sensitive subject that we're talking about today. So if we can keep the questions general, so just kind of no specific names, um, just so that we can keep that anonymous. Um, I'm not going to unmute anyone, so if all the questions can go in there that would be brilliant okay i think that's all of the kind of house rules done so we can actually get started with the presentation now so um today we've got myself natalie brown and uh, vanessa davis we're going to talk through um understanding the menstrual cycle when working with female athletes so just to get started to introduce myself so i'm natalie brown um, I am a research scientist working with the Welsh Institute of Performance Science. I work predominantly now um, in the area of the female athlete, specifically focusing on the menstrual cycle. Um, prior to that, though, I was working as a sports scientist in swimming and I've done my PhD in um, competition preparation and recovery. Ness, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Vanessa Davis, so I'm based at Sport Wales. I'm a physiologist there, um, and I work with um, with athletics, so within, within the endurance part of athletics, and also with rhythmic gymnastics as well. Perfect, thanks Ness. So, to get started, to give you a little bit of a background actually around the Female Athlete project that I've worked on, um, it gives a little bit of context for and part one and part two of these webinars that we're going to deliver. Um, so the Female Athlete Project started off by interviewing elite Welsh female athletes to try and understand their experiences, their perceptions of the menstrual cycle and how that interacted with training and competition performance. And off the back of that, different themes that have come out from those conversations is driven some of the work that we're kind of working on now. Um, to start off with today, we're going to look at menstrual health um, and then next week we're going to look at the impact of training and performance. But there are other areas such as coping strategies, openness of conversation and the symptoms, which all interlink as well. And I'd say definitely these are just the starting points for the next um, this week and next week. But hopefully it gives a, an insight and um, we can build on that moving forward. So today's aim, um, part one, female menstrual health. So first of all, I'm going to run through a bit of a biology 101 of the menstrual cycle and discuss that, some of the hormones that are involved in that. Um, we're then going to move on to what is considered regular and irregular in relation to the menstrual cycle. And then finally, looking at um, the influence of energy availability and how that interacts with the menstrual cycle and female health in what is termed as uh, relative energy deficiency in sport. So kind of the main aims of today. So just to get started, the menstrual cycle is a, another vital sign. So females are actually quite fortunate that they have this extra vital sign. So having a regular period with only mild symptoms is a really good, un really good indicator of good underlying health. So having a menstrual cycle, I've got there, is like an extra vital sign. It's like your pulse or your body temperature. So if your cycle can tell you if it's in a, your usual rhythm, but it can also tell you if there's something that's a bit off, um, if your hormone health isn't quite right. Um, and that's quite important because when we're talking around hormone health, although the menstrual cycle is predominantly involved in reproductive hormones, there's actually, as you can see on the screen now, so many different hormones that interact with different parts of the body. So whether that's insulin that's affecting um, your carbohydrate metabolism 
or whether that's cortisol that's looking again that links in with different metabolism but you've also got um, growth hormone um, they also regulate heart rate blood pressure so there's so many different aspects and females actually have by having a period and having a regular period with only mild symptoms can be a really good indicator that you've got good hormone health um, as opposed to if you miss or have irregular periods. So going on to a bit of a menstrual cycle 101. So first of all, um, the graph displaying on the, the screen there is um, the typical fluctuations you have throughout the menstrual cycle. So if we start off at day one, day one is um, when a period starts. So when you experience your first bleed. That is then followed by um, what we call the follicular phase and the luteal phase. During those two phases, you've got four hormones which fluctuate and interact with each other. So you've got estrogen and progesterone, which are the blue and the purple lines. And then you've also got luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, which are the orange and yellow lines. And these all interact and cause different points within the cycle. So to go into a bit more detail just around those hormones really, you've got FSH, that's actually um, causes an egg to mature. So we need to remember that the menstrual cycle is actually a um, biological function aimed at reproduction. So the FSH actually causes an egg to mature and causes this release of estrogen. And the estrogen um, is what coincides with ovulation. And then following ovulation, um, which is triggered by ALH, you actually then have an increase in progesterone. The reason for that is it actually starts to maintain the uterus lining ready to receive a fertilized egg for pregnancy. If that doesn't happen, there's no pregnancy, then that's when progesterone levels decrease and um, the uterus lining sheds and that's the period. So if we return back to the graph and how that looks in relation to the two phases, so the follicular phase, as I said, is where you've got that increase in estrogen, and that's pre-ovulation. And then following that, you then go into your luteal phase, which is more associated with the increase in progesterone. Um, towards the end of the luteal phase, you then have a quite a rapid decrease in both estrogen and progesterone, and it's the decrease of those hormones that is causing the shedding of the uterus lining, which results in the period, and that takes you back to day one. So how does that relate to how female athletes feel and how they perform? So first of all, the period is associated with symptoms of cramping, bleeding. Um, they're the two main ones that are normally reported, um, the kind of stomach cramps and lower back pain. When you've got this increase in estrogen, generally females, and I'm not just talking about athletes now either, they generally feel strong and energized. So they've got lots of energy. They're ready to go and do daily activities, feeling ready to exercise. But then actually, as you start going into um, this progesterone levels, when they start to increase, you actually start feeling, um, can have symptoms such as being more clumsy, less coordination, feeling um, less motivated, really lethargic, but you also can start feeling that moody, irritable, a bit agitated. And that can also, um, again, that similar um, phase there and that late luteal phase, athletes can experience um, GI disturbance, maybe weight gain, bloating, and again, cramps can start towards the end of that. And some of those linked to the GI disturbance and bloating can also transfer into um, the start of the period as well. So there's an overlap in some of these symptoms between the end of the menstrual cycle, um, the end of the luteal phase, sorry, and the start of the period. So just to go through how some of those um, hormones might influence health and well-being. So estrogen really helps lift a mood and helps you feel motivated. So it gives you a really healthy mood. Both estrogen and progesterone promote a healthy weight and they both aid um, healthy metabolism. And then also healthy bones. So estrogen and progesterone are both really important for bone health. 
Um, and a lack of oestrogen can um, affect peak bone mass. Because actually, you reach your peak bone mass around, around the age of 20. So if you've got a female that's not experienced in periods, hasn't got that oestrogen level, it can really affect bone health early on. Pass over to you, Ness. Okay. So um, two words that we kind of use uh, quite regularly around um, the menstrual cycle is, is regular and irregular. And this um, refers to both the length of the cycle and also the, the heaviness of the periods and um, the symptoms that they experience. So when we're talking about the length of the cycle, we're talking about the first day of your period and all the way through to the first day of your next period. So that whole cycle that Nat's just talked through. So when an individual first starts, um, starts their period, they tend to be quite irregular. Um, but after a couple of years, they do tend to settle down. And that is both in terms of the length of the cycle and the, the symptoms that they tend to experience and, and the heaviness as well. But it is important to remember that everybody is individual. So that's why it's really, really important to get to understand your athlete and how your your athlete feels and, and what their cycle is. Um, so the heaviness and the length of the period is dependent on the hormones and the, and the level of the hormones that each individual has. Um, they can fluctuate. And there are certain factors as well that can that can affect this fluctuation in hormones. So, for example, stress. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, first of all, stress um, is a factor that can, can affect the hormone levels. So for an example, um, if an athlete happens to be stressed um, in the first half of their cycle, this could cause um, a delay in ovulation, which can then have a knock-on effect to a cause, of, cause a delay um, in the peak of, of progesterone. So this could happen a couple of days later, which means that any symptoms that the athlete might be might experience could happen a couple of days later. And then as a consequence, um, the period actually starts a few days later as well. Um, so stress is, is one thing that can have an impact, but there are many other things. So, for example, um, life stages. So as I've already just mentioned, if somebody's just um, started their period, then that's going to probably be quite irregular. Um, as you're moving through through life, um, pregnancy, so the hormones um, change around pregnancy, um, and then also later in life around the menopause. So the, the concentration can, of hormones can vary at, at different stages. Uh, sleep can have um, a big impact on, on the hormone fluctuation as well. So for example, shift work, if you've got anyone who's sort of um, doing shifts, this can this can have a big impact um, and jet lag. So if you've got athletes that are um, traveling a lot for competitions or training camps, then that travel can have an impact on their cycle. Um, contraceptives also. So if somebody is taking an oral contraceptive, they're actually um, dampening down the natural hormones in the body. They're just putting synthetic hormones into the body and the athlete then won't um, experience a natural cycle. And then lastly, any energy imbalances can also cause hormone fluctuations. So this can be caused by either excessive exercise. So if somebody is, is sort of training too hard, and also um, if there's inadequate nutrition. So if there's not um, enough, if there's not a right, the right nutrition to sustain the exercise that is being done. And if somebody has like a particularly low, dangerously low BMI, this can cause um, periods to actually stop, which is known as um, amenorrhea. Um, so that can, that can have an, um, a big Im impact as well. So if we, look a bit more in detail around that um, energy imbalance on the next slide. OK, so if you do have an athlete that is in this energy imbalance, it, it's, it can lead to relative energy deficiency in sport or otherwise known as REDS. So this is caused by the low energy availability. So this can either be 
due to the nutritional intake not being sufficient enough to cover the energy demands of both training and the bodily processes just for everyday life, or if um, excessive training load is reducing the available that's energy to sorry the energy that is available to support um, to support life. You may well have heard of um, the female athlete triad as well. So within the triad, um, that considers the effect um, of mental, mental function and bone health. Whereas with REDS, it sort of um, recognises and looks at the larger impact that it has on all systems within the body. Um, and it can actually affect males as well. So there are still quite a few conversations happening out there. And, and um, I've heard it myself with athletes where they're told that it's actually normal if they're not having a period because they're an endurance athlete, they're doing large volumes of, of training and it's normal, so not to worry about it. But this is not true at all. And this perception needs to change. It's not OK if you're not having your period, it's not OK. And there are health implications that, that are linked to this. OK, so on the next slide. OK, so this. Um, diagram just shows illustrates around this low um, energy availability so if you look at the first diagram the first uh, man on the on the wonky seesaw so this is looking at um intentional low energy availability so this is where um an athlete might intentionally be reducing their nutritional um uh, uh, reducing their nutrition because they intentionally want to lose weight and they think it's going to um um, increased performance and short term they might see this you might see some short term um, improvements but this is not um, sustainable and, and, and can't continue if you go to the other far side to so the other the other unbalanced seesaw this is um, in um, unintentional um, low energy availability so somebody who's just not managing to um, get the right energy intake to match a high training load but they're not realizing they're doing it it's not not intentional that they're doing it and um, so what we are aiming for is the little man in the middle so where somebody is able to match their energy match their intake with the energy demands of training so they can they can alter their fuel based on the training that they that they need. Um, and just one one point around um, kind of like the loss of of periods. If um, a female goes for a period of about three months and and they're not having a period, then this is actually a sign that something isn't right. Okay, so following on from what Ness was just saying there, and actually picking up on that missing a period um so having a that lack of energy availability can really influence menstrual health um and as i said at the start you've got that vital sign and in the instance incidents that you don't have a good energy balance that can cause periods to stop um, and normally we say if they've stopped for three months um then it's you know advised to go and seek medical advice and to kind of see what's going on, make sure there's no underlying medical conditions either. So just to expand on that a little bit more as well, the, the effect that can have. So an energy imbalance not only is affecting um, the menstrual cycle, but also how it impacts on growth and development. So as I said at the start, um, how it links to bone health. So estrogen is really important for bone development. And in the instance that you, especially in younger years, and when that peak bone mass is being achieved and the lack of estrogen can actually cause um, lower bone density, um, which has longer term health. So when I look at the talk about impact on health and well-being, it's actually thinking about the athlete health from a long term perspective. So although they might be um, they might not experience any stress fractures because of poor bone health when they're younger that still doesn't mean that actually later on in life, especially when they hit menopause, that they might not experience um, stress fractures or be at greater risk of osteoporosis. Um, and you've got how it just generally impacts on health and wellbeing. So I mentioned at the start how hormones influence heart rate, blood pressure. So there's so many different things at play um, that interact with each other that can Im 
that can impact health and well-being um, before we even go on to consider the adverse effect it would have on performance. So one thing to raise on performance is, although in the first instance you might have an improvement in performance, that's not something that's sustainable um, in a low energy availability state, which we've got no periods. So quite a still now, um, Ness kind of mentioned it, but some females think it's a really positive because it's more convenient if they don't have a period. But actually, the health implications, but also the performance implications of um, reaching their full potential just won't be achieved. So linking to that, just for female athletes, a regular menstrual cycle is a barometer of hormone health. It's really important to have a regular cycle. And actually, to touch on that now with our current situation, Ness talked through how stress might be impacting it. And there's the potential that with COVID, with so many um, kind of uncertainties, that athletes are feeling more stressed now. And that could be impacting on their menstrual cycle and having more irregular um, cycles or experiencing more symptoms that are associated with that. So that might be something just to consider, especially now, again, in quite a high stress situation. And then finally, I've put there that all contraceptives can mask problems. So we're not going to go into contraceptives today, but just something to touch on that actually um, female athletes, if they're taking um, a form of contraceptive or using a form of contraceptive um, and they're still experiencing a regular withdrawal bleed, that's not necessarily an indicator of good hormone health because it's not a natural cycle. It's not regular. It's the withdrawal of the exogenous hormones that's causing those withdrawal bleeds. So actually, it can go undetected if you do have an energy imbalance when you're using um, some forms of contraception. So just some things to talk about um, of how we can maybe action or change some of um, the things we've discussed already regarding energy availability and also um, primary amenorrhea. So I've put there changing commonly held beliefs around amenorrhea. So when I say amenorrhea, that means the absence of periods. And you can have both primary and secondary amenorrhea. Primary is if you haven't started your period by the time we normally say around age 15. Um, that's the time to refer and seek medical advice. Um, in some sports, again, there's this um, still sometimes perceptions that actually it's just because you're doing a lot of training that you're starting later. But actually, um, it's good to, to make sure that there's nothing happening that's causing um, amenorrhea if you haven't started by the time you're 15. And then secondary amenorrhea is linked to um, all the factors that Ness described that affect um, regular and irregular periods. Within sport, it's really important, um, I think, for to try and change some of those perceptions if we look at coach understanding and education and also athlete education. So both of us have mentioned athletes finding it positive that they're not having a period because it's more convenient, but actually providing some information and education around that, um, the health implications and also the performance implications. And starting to understand and link actually how low energy availability also affects things like um, your immune system. It can cause um, maybe more injuries linked to poor performance. So again, increasing that awareness so there's a, a greater understanding of the effects it can have both short term and long term on female athletes. I've put their um, medical support where required. So actually, it's OK and should be advised to seek medical support. And one thing can be really helpful is if athletes are self-monitoring, they can develop an awareness of when they do have regular periods, also when they are irregular, um, and not just with missing periods, but also their symptoms. So are there any certain stages they have worsened symptoms, um, distress cause symptoms to get worse? Um, through all of that, it can start building a bigger picture that allow as well maybe better conversations to be had um, and better management of those. So I've kind of put three key points down the side there of really important to promote a healthy training environment where we're really comfortable, 
really happy and open talking about the menstrual cycle. Um, wellbeing and support, so ensuring that the individual um, is a person-centered approach um, and that we actually look after each individual athlete, thinking about their long-term development, not just their performance short-term. And just a little touch there is um, just to be aware sometimes of uh, recommendations to change weight, just if that causes any changes in uh, fuel consumption, like food consumption or more or less training, and um, that might tip that balance that Ness described. So health and wellness for athletes and performance. So this kind of just summarizes a little bit really that you've got by having an increased awareness of the positive aspects of energy and how important fuel is for performance and also for that health and well-being. Prevention and awareness is key for everyone involved. And I actually have missed out um, on that previous slide, having um, parents having an awareness as well, so that we can all kind of interact and communicate um, when an athlete started their period, if it's affecting them in training, and if it's affecting them in their day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day life. Um, definitely some females will have such severe stomach cramps that it affects their day-to-day -day activities, let alone how that impacts on training and competition. So definitely look after the person first for that long-term development and a shared approach. Just reiterating there that medical support if athletes haven't started their periods by the age of 15 or if a missed period for more than three months. And to really help with all of this is if athletes have that increased self-awareness, they're able to recognize what's regular, what's irregular, and therefore how that might be impacting both their health and wellness, and then we'll discuss more next week how that might interact with performance as well. So just to touch on that before, and um, to hopefully lead us nicely into next week, I've put here, um, you've got the effect on the athlete um, from having um, poor hormone health or menstrual dysfunction. So many different factors that can affect from a biological perspective. But if we look at the bottom of the effect on athlete performance, that can range anything from um, decreased coordination, uh, decreased training response, all the way over to actually how it makes an athlete feel. So depression, irritability, and that's inevitably going to impact on their performance of how they feel, how they might be in training, um, how they perform a session. It's, it's all interlinked. And you can see there on the graph that although at the start performance might increase similarly in an energy balanced athlete to um, a red S athlete, actually, as you kind of go over time with training load, you've got a greater improvement in performance in that energy balanced athlete than you have in that red S athlete. Hopefully that will lead in nicely to next week where we'll be able to talk um, in part two a little bit more around the menstrual cycle and how that interacts with training and performance. So that's everything for today from the presentation. Um, just signposted there to the Health for Performance website. Um, that's quite useful if you want to find out more information around um, Red S. As I said today, I think this is just the starting point um, and a brief indication of menstrual health and female athletes. Um, so that might guide you to a little bit more information. Otherwise, should we go on to questions? Ness, have you got anything, if I missed anything? <laughs> no, no, I think that's everything. Yeah. Perfect. Well, we've got, um, we'll go through the questions and work through them. Hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them. Um, but if we don't, due to time constraints, um, I've put both um, our emails on that slide, which I'll leave up now whilst we're answering questions. And if we don't get around to answering your question, um, feel free just to drop us an email and we'll try and get back to you um, and respond to those. So, questions. Okay, so we've got one from Gareth. Davis, is the Fitter Woman app worth using? 
So do you want to go for that one, Ness, or do you want me yeah. to jump in? Um, yeah, do you want to jump in? You've got a bit more experience of using the app. Yeah, Can you no speak problem. to Georgie? He developed it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'd definitely say um, using some form of app can be really worthwhile for female athletes. Um, like I said, to increase that self-awareness. Um, there's different options um, that you can use. And also, it doesn't have to be an app. It's probably a good point just to touch on now that it's probably up to that individual female as to whether they an app to record um, their menstrual cycle is useful or whether they've got a diary that they prefer just to jot down their symptoms or just put a star and um, whatever it might be as to when their um, periods start and how that might interact with training. But certainly things like um, Fit A Woman app can be useful for some athletes. Um, there is a lot of information on there, so it might be um, that awareness with the coach as well, just to be aware that, you, that you're using that and to have a discussion between the athlete and coach as to how some of the information might interact with the training program that the, the coach has written as well. Um, there's other apps like Clue, which is quite good, which um that doesn't have as much information on but it's more if you just want a simple solution to to kind of track your symptoms in your cycle can't see any more questions come up yet is there any more questions Ooh. Here we go. Okay, so if an athlete suffers from red S and a stress fracture when they are 20, 21, but then gives give up sport to recover, are they likely to have not reached peak bone mass and are at risk of problems in the future? Will the damage done at that age last? Um, so actually, um, it has been um, shown that by returning periods, taking time off, um, getting that energy balance back right can make sure that you can still um, basically achieve that hormone health um, and increase your kind of bone health as well and um, to make sure it doesn't deteriorate anymore. Have you got anything more to add to that, Ness? No, no, I think that covers it. Oh, there's another question. Um, Will these go online? Yeah, as, as far as I'm aware, I think these will be available to, to watch afterwards. So you should be able to access it. What would you consider an irregular period? Okay, um, so do you want to go with that one, Ness? Yeah, I can do, yeah. So when, when we were talking about um, the irregular we were saying are kind of around around the length the, the cycle length so if your um period varies greatly in terms of the length of it so they say that the average the average length of a period is 28 days but it can vary from 21 to 40. um so if your if your cycle is is um is irregular it would mean that you're kind of each period is is like from a different number of days so you, you could be going from 21 days one for one month to 40 days for another month so we would class that as being irregular um and then also around the symptoms as well so um around like the, the heaviness of the, of the bleeding or any um symptoms you might be experiencing like the cramps as well would you add anything else, Nat? Um, I think you've, most um, of it, I think, Fiona, you, know, you might have actually phrased this already, but if the cycles vary in length by more than seven to nine days as well, so say one month your period is 21 days and the next month that's 35 days and then that goes back down to 28 days, that would also maybe be seen as irregular because you've got quite a lot of variation in how um, long each cycle lasts. But I think other than that, that was... Yeah, um, we've just had a, a note put on from um, one of our nutritionists who says that you keep building bone mass until your mid-twenties. 
that helps refer back to the other question that was early answered um, asked earlier. Perfect. Okay, next question. Um, both my daughters get tired on the second day. Is this something they have to put up with or is there something they can do to assist? So um, I'm going to go with the second days referring to day two of a period. Um, and there's definitely, um, I think we'll probably touch a bit more on this in part two next week of actually some symptoms are all manageable there's different things that you can do around your menstrual cycle it's obviously great that they've recognized um that there's that pattern that they do get tired so um it's looking at then what you can do around that so whether that's um, making sure you have increased rest looking at what your sleep strategies are so that you try and um get really good sleep for recovery um looking at your um, fuel intake, so your nutrition, um, and also thinking about maybe what sort of exercise they're doing. So actually, if you know that they're always tired on day two, actually is doing maybe more of a light session, um, kind of more beneficial and kind of get more out of that rather than trying to do a really high intense session um, that actually if they're feeling really tired, they're just not going to be able to maybe achieve that that full potential is there anything you'd add to that ness no no i think you've covered covered everything there and as you say this is um an area that we'll perhaps look at in a bit more detail in the second part next week as well so but yeah yeah you've covered everything i would have suggested Um, next question, if, so I didn't see there was another one there, but I've, I've scrolled down now, I've seen there's more questions. <laughs> I was happily like, oh, we've got no more questions. Um, if there's an athlete with amenorrhea who has proved osteoporosis through DEXA scan, is there any suggested exercises or training plans to help recover bone mass? Ness, have you got any ideas for that one? If not... Mm. No, not at the moment. I'd... That's okay. Um, it's not something I've specifically worked in, but I definitely yeah. um, refer you to that Health for Performance website. Um, there's some information, there's a lot of information around Red S on there that might be able to actually give you more details um, and more suggestions of maybe how to recover that, um, specifically when looking at exercise and training plans. I think the main thing is around looking at um that amenorrhea of getting the energy balance back to like that nice stable energy balance um and then start looking at how you introduce exercise um alongside that long term what are the long-term consequences of amenorrhea are they reversible so most, again, it is really individual, and I should have said this at the start, that actually the information we're given is really generic, um, and obviously can, every individual is different and will respond differently. Um, but there's definitely been shown that you can reverse the consequences of amenorrhea. So by ensuring you, um, if it is energy balance that's caused that, um, that by making sure that that's returned, that you can actually start having, um, getting a regular period back again. Um, and also that can ensure hormone health starts improving. Um, and even things like fertility can be, um, can return to make sure that you're able to get pregnant long-term. So there definitely are um, reversible um, symptoms associated with it. How do you discuss this with your coach if he's an elderly male? Oh. <laughs> yeah, a tricky so, one. <laughs> um, it can be, but one thing that's quite, um, one of the things from the female athlete interviews I did was actually, and having done some more um, workshops with coaches now, 
is everyone's actually really worried how everyone else is going to feel. So, for example, I'd be more worried how you're, if you're going to feel awkward me delivering and talking about the metro cycle compared to how I actually feel talking about it. So that's one thing and something to be aware of that actually your elderly male coach may be really comfortable talking about the metro cycle. He's just more worried that you're going to feel awkward talking about it. So definitely think about that. And um, it's again using, I don't want to keep going back to it, but actually using an athlete that monitoring of your menstrual cycle can be a really good way to bring up discussing it with your coach. So actually saying that you've been you've noticed over the last three months of your cycle that the week before you always experience certain symptoms. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about how that impacts on your training and what can we do to to work on that. Um, also, uh, I think that's probably one of the key things, but definitely the more it's talked about, the more open, the more comfortable people start feeling talking about the metro cycle. So for me, this is all I, I talk about this a lot um, and a lot of people also say how much I talk around the metro cycle and it doesn't bother me, doesn't faze me. Um, and it's just something if we start these conversations now, hopefully that'll start changing. Okay, what happens if an athlete is taking contraception that stops periods? How might that affect their long-term health as an athlete? Ness, do you want me to take that one or? Um, yeah, yeah, happy to do that. <laughs> Stop talking soon, I promise. I'll let, some, I'll let Ness talk instead. Um, so taking contraception can stop periods. That's different to experiencing amenorrhea. Um, when your hormones, because you're putting in exogenous hormones, that's actually causing your periods to stop because the aim of that is to stop you getting pregnant. Um, and so actually stopping your periods through contraception isn't the same as um, missing periods because when you have a natural cycle. Um, the only thing I'd link is obviously what I said is sometimes you just, because you don't have that natural cycle, you just take away that extra vital sign that females have got that tells you um, if you're in a good good energy state and a good hormone health. Um, but it is about balancing it. So actually, you might be taking contraception to avoid pregnancy or to manage some of your symptoms so that you can perform. So there's kind of both positive and negatives to contraception. Um, I think that answers that question. <laughs> Okay, so next, oh, I've, lost, I've lost the next one, sorry. Okay, I've got it up so I can read that one out. A lot of female high, high dumpers are significantly underweight. The training volume is not necessarily as high as endurance athletes. Is there anything a coach should watch, should watch for her? I think it's, um, Ness, if I start this and then you can kind of add on to it. For me, it would be, if you're monitoring um, periods, you're monitoring um, how the athlete's feeling and making sure they've got a, a regular period. Um, alongside that, having the conversations is really important between the coach and the athlete. So although um, a coach can obviously observe, being able to have that conversation with the female athlete is really important um, to talk to them to understand if, if they are um, looking at their weight, actually how does that relate to um, their menstrual cycle? Do they still have a regular cycle? Um, does it, are there any symptoms that are kind of really affecting, um, so does stress really affect it? Um, or the areas that Ness talked around? I think would be my kind of advice on that one. Yeah. Okay, so what if your period was regular and then started to come sooner than 21 days, like 18 or 19 days, would you think something is wrong? Um, again, that goes back to the sort of 
irregular and 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 regular so um just you know if your cycle is is becoming irregular it could be a sign that that something isn't quite right maybe um and especially if you're having kind of quite short cycles um it could it could show that something isn't isn't quite right and, and needs to be looked at and what would you say around that now yeah definitely i think um if it gets shorter than 15 days um that's when i'd probably follow up on that and just go and speak to gp or um the doctor um it can be it's also dependent um how old that individual is as well so for example if it's um someone who's younger that's just kind of within the first maybe two to three years of having their periods it's really normal for everything like the length of a period to change how heavy it is um so that might be a factor that i just touch i don't obviously know the situation around that so we'll just touch on that um that that could be an influencing factor um but again if that's also something that's happening more recently definitely the change in covid and stress um and kind of the the change in how we're all working um and training that also might be a factor this influence in that so I'd maybe monitor it for maybe three months and then see if that's settled down or if it's getting any shorter or a lot of variation between uh, the length of the cycle Yes, I've lost my mouse. Can you go to the next question, please? Yeah, hang on, let's go down. Go. Um, um, is there anything you should avoid in your training during your period? Oh, hang on, my screen's gone dark now. Um, again, I think um, this is all very individual and um, depends on how you're feeling and the symptoms that you're getting as to whether you know you want to adapt or or alter anything there aren't any set guidelines that say you shouldn't do this during your period and you should you should just rest um i would say it's definitely an, an individual thing and if there are certain um symptoms that you're struggling from and then you're feeling that you're not able to um you know complete your training to you know fully um i think we had the example earlier of somebody who gets very tired on their second day so again i think it's just it's just very individual and how you're feeling and what you feel that you're able to able to achieve would you agree with that now yeah i think um for me one of my main aims doing work around the metro cycle with females is so that females can perform on any day of their cycle and it's about identifying um, if there's any reason why you can't perform at your best on any day of your cycle and then looking at what strategies or how you manage that so you, that you're able to. So personally, I wouldn't say there's anything to avoid. Um, definitely, as Ness has said, it depends on how you feel. So actually, if you've got really bad stomach cramps, are you going to do a really high intensity session and achieve that to your absolute best? But on the flip side of that is actually what could you do to try and manage those cramps so that you are able to do that if you want to. Is there a link between low ferritin levels and irregular periods? I'm like, is, is that a nutritionist in the uh, audience? <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> There's, when If we talked around irregular um, in relation to heavy menstrual bleeding, then heavy menstrual bleeding can obviously um, influence um, iron levels. Um, but I wouldn't like to comment on the other way around if low ferritin levels cause irregular periods. Um, Um, okay, can hormonal contraceptions have a negative effect on your performance? Um, again, it's going back to that old, um, it's very individual. 
Um, so um, if an athlete chooses to take um, oral contraception, it's about working out what works best for them and, and, and what's the best one for them. And um, so it's kind of, it might be a bit of trial and error and a sort of discussions with your GP about what what's what works best for you and and, um, and and what you feel best best on um so i think again it, it can vary some people can be affected by it and other other people won't be um but it's about finding the right one for you yeah from a this is me with a research head on from a research <laughs> perspective um at the moment I would say there's such um, there's not a lot of research in female athletes and the menstrual cycle, hormonal contraceptives, and add into the mix is there's so many different forms of contraception as well that um, actually how it influences and interacts with performance is not something that there's really good evidence to suggest how how it interacts at the moment. So next question, what can be done to make conditions such as endometriosis easier to cope with whilst trying to maintain high level of performance? I think um, for me, obviously, I don't, I think we keep going back to the same thing, but um, if you can identify what aspects of endometriosis are um, and when within a cycle it's affecting um, you to be able to maintain that high level of performance through monitoring, tracking it, looking at what your symptoms are and also looking at how that might interact with training. So actually, is it worse around certain types of sessions, better around other sessions? Um, do things like yoga help release, help ease some of the pain? Um, how can you actually learn and have a better awareness of yourself and um, managing endometriosis to then be able to work out how you can actually cope with that and what strategies there are to manage that so whether that's through um changing what sort of exercise you're doing at certain times whether that's um looking at your diet whether that's looking at even things like having a hot water bottle does that help with training simple even like little solutions like that of actually making it work so you've got a strategy around exactly what your symptoms are and when you experience them to be able to maintain that performance okay i think we've got time for five more minutes of questions um and then as i said any ones that we don't get through um please email us and we'll we'll try and respond via email mm -hmm. so next question i keep losing my mouse i'm really sorry we've got another one around um contraception if i read it out so some athletes don't take contraception as they're very worried about it affecting performance how can it negatively impact performance can it be taken effectively without decreasing performance i think Probably what we discussed with that previous um, question around contraception covered quite a lot of that and the fact that we don't necessarily know in the research right now how it impacts performance. Um, it's about balancing it and making an informed decision as to why you're taking contraception. So, for example, if that's to avoid pregnancy um, so that you're able to train and compete, then obviously that's... Yeah sounds silly but getting pregnant is automatically going to um, affect <laughs> performance anyway um, but also just having awareness of if it is causing any negative symptoms and um, but on the flip side of that if it is managing any symptoms that were affecting performance so that you are able to train and compete um, it's around the individual having that making that informed decision and being aware of the options and aware of how it might influence them as an individual yeah, and we've just had another comment put in from our wonderful nutritionist who's helping us. Um, there's so many different types of contraception. That individual, individuals need to understand the risks and benefits of each type. So, again, it's just kind of making those informed decisions and looking at what works best for you. 
I think we've got one more one more question. Is it important to consider if you're changing groups, your peer is made desync to other females around you? Sorry, I'm just reading that again. Is it important to consider if you're changing groups, your periods may desync to other females around you? Um, so I'm just trying to understand exactly what the question is. I think, I think it's because there's always that talk, isn't there, that you, if you spend a lot of time with in a group of females your periods all sink it all, they all sink uh right okay um but i don't know whether that actually oh it's it's definitely one of those that i i'm going to say right now that i don't know if it's fact or myth at the moment yeah um, <laughs> don't either <laughs> because i've heard some instances within training groups when actually all female, you know the the um support team working with them have said yes they've kind of synced with each other and in other instances when it doesn't happen at all um so i think the main thing is just to i don't think it's an important thing to consider the, the more important thing is to consider the individuals and how that individual um what their 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 own metro cycle is like so as long as their own metro cycle is staying regular um and um i think that's that's probably the more important thing than anything else so we've had one more just pop up if we've got time for that um is it sensible to marry up a down or light week for endurance athletes with the period because this will be difficult for group training I think what we like, we'll wait for part two to answer that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that will lead nicely into next week. Um, to look at um, kind of put that as down or light weeks for endurance athletes. Um, so we'll definitely talk about that a lot more next week in relation to what training you might consider in relation to symptoms. Um, but I think. I think it's more rather than looking at down weeks um, or a lighter week for endurance athletes when they're on their period, because actually some athletes might feel way better when they're on their period, whereas other athletes might um, experience their symptoms a little bit more the week before. So I think it's actually um, rather than, I'm not saying not adjust in training because in some instances if you've got really bad stomach cramps or really severe symptoms then training might need to be adjusted but actually looking at um, how you can manage um, how the individual can talk to the coach and really maximize their sessions by being aware of their symptoms and how to manage those so that they're able to um, complete the sessions which are, are being prescribed. Would you agree with that, Ness? Yeah, definitely. And as I say, we'll we'll discuss it more in in the session next week as well. So hopefully, we can give you some more answers then. Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up then by saying thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. Um, if you could fill out the evaluation form that I believe will be sent out as a follow up email um, after the session or tomorrow. Um, it would be great to receive your feedback um, and then we'll hopefully see you all next week if you can join us for part two of this where we'll look a bit more in relation to the metro cycle and training and performance. <laughs>